Blasphemous, huh? This is a 2019 Metroidvania with something of a reputation. My first exposure to it was several years ago on some internet forum. It was a post of some proof-of-concept art pieces and animations. At the time, no one really knew what this game was going to be. All that could be gleaned from the post was that it was vaguely religious and pretty fucking brutal. A few years of not hearing much about it later, it released on Steam. So, how is it? Yeah, pretty good actually. The game is set in the dark fantasy world of Custodia, where all of the residents, living and sometimes dead, are affected by a cosmic malevolent force only ever referred to as the Miracle. Sometimes for better, usually for worse. You take on the role of a voiceless, faceless hero with a funny helmet known as the Penitent One, amongst other things. His goal is a bit ambiguous, but it's implied he wants to put an end to the Miracle. This game has become an intense fixation of mine, so let's begin. Blasphemous is known for having an incredibly distinct art style, among a genre full of games with distinct art styles. This is one of the very few games I've played that managed to pull off a dark fantasy feel while still appearing vibrant and colorful, which is quite impressive. The imagery on display is just... I mean, are you kidding me? I quite literally don't know what to say other than it's gorgeous and I've never seen anything like it. Some of the NPCs and bosses are forever burned into my memory as some of the most mind-bending surrealism beautifully realized in this animated pixel art style. As for the zones the game takes place in, it's a lot of gothic architecture but crafted with a sense of identity and a pragmatic attention to detail. Sometimes areas feel similar to each other, but nothing feels outright copy-pasted, and the levels also manage to avoid feeling too, uh video gamey? They feel thought out in the world as a place that really existed and saw use for something, rather than just as a video game level. Just as an example, the rooftop area is sprawling, barely connected by these extremely rickety looking elevator platforming sections. Meanwhile, Hondo, an underground area, is much more dense, dark, and claustrophobic. The enemies inhabiting these levels are equally well realized. Some of them are a bit copy-paste gameplay-wise, but the visual creativity is top-notch. I love this one charging enemy that runs at you with a giant bell, and whenever he hits, he makes a funny noise. It's just great. Also, I have to talk about the main character. I'm kind of in love with him. The goofy-ass helmet is iconic for sure, but I think there's more to it than that. He's my favorite protagonist archetype, utterly silent, but you can still get a pretty good read on how he thinks and feels by observing his mannerisms and such. I draw a lot of parallels between him and the Doom Slayer. He's animated differently to other Metroidvania protags. Most of them look explorative or aimless. They don't know where they're going exactly, but they don't care much either. They're they're on an adventure. Now look at the penitent one. This is not a man on an adventure. This is a man on a mission. He's much more brazen and dedicated in everything he does. He twists and moves his entire body when he attacks, trying to put as much driving force as possible into each strike. He hits hard and fast, but almost all of his moves have a ton of end lag. Everything he does conveys a personality that acts first and thinks later, and the massive flamboyant cone helmet only amplifies these traits, I'd argue. Sorry, I'll stop talking about funny cone helmet now. 
let's talk audio. The sound design as far as ambiance and combat is concerned seems to be going for a more authentic and immersive approach. This is a lot more noticeable in the few areas that don't play music, but the utter absence of sound combined with movements and sword slashes of your character can make the game feel extremely eerie and isolated at times. The executions in particular are worth mention. I'm not normally one to be wowed by pixel gore, but there were a fair few occasions where I'd think, oh damn, he fucking died. Primarily because these animations are also coupled with some extremely good audio, sounding unsettlingly violent and immersive to a fault. Most of these sounds are slightly drowned out by the music, which is extremely good, but a lot of areas and bosses tend to use a similar sounding melody. It's a very good melody, but something I noticed regardless. Once again, I'm at a loss for words. It's an incredibly memorable soundtrack regardless. The voice acting I think is worth a mention as well. Voice acting in indie games can be a bit of a coin flip, but here it's nice. Some of the performances really stick out to me. Now may your sword full of guilt with mine of gold collide. Let them hurt and march in procession. I curse you forever in name. I bless you forever in death. Penitent one, you who carry the painful guilt in your cracked hands. Lend it to us and alleviate our burden. Lend it to us and wipe away our tears. Because it is an act of penitence. This trial tree that sprouted years after his death was named the Knot of the Three Worlds. For three are its twisted trunks, and three were the words spoken by that youngster before he died. My great guilt. As I'm editing this video, I'm having to fight the urge to show this entire two and a half minute long monologue. It's amazing. You might be getting irritated with how much time I'm devoting to this, and that's because I'm trying to do it the justice it deserves, but I don't think I or anyone really could do that. It is impossible to overstate how fucking gorgeous this game looks and sounds at all times. But enough of that artsy fartsy right brain shit, how do you actually play Blasphemous?
Like I said, this is a Metroidvania, but the game loop is a bit different to its peers. Your average Metroidvania consists of three parts, combat, exploration, and movement. But note how I present this. Blasphemous has devoted a lot of time to perfecting the first two parts, but compared to other modern mainstays of the genre, the movement isn't just lacking, it's basically completely absent. Your movement options never meaningfully change or evolve from the start of the game. What you start with is what you get in that regard. Alright, there's a couple of sword moves that move you around a bit, but they've been pretty clearly fine-tuned to only really function at their fullest in combat. So if you also enjoy the platforming gameplay that Metroidvania typically provides, Blasphemous will be a bit lacking on that front. Personally, a gameplay gap like this doesn't bug me because the combat and exploration are amazingly well executed. You've got two bars, health and fervor. Health regenerates by using bile flasks or certain character upgrades. Fervor is used to cast magic called prayers. It regenerates by hitting enemies, executing enemies, and again, certain upgrades. You also have a currency called Tears of Atonement. Acquired primarily from defeating enemies and bosses, this is used to buy things from merchants and upgrade your character in various ways. The combat loop isn't a whole lot new. You got a slide dodge, a timed parry, baby move, big move, combo move, gap closer move, plunging move, projectile move, it's all a jolly good time when it works. I'm not by any means saying this is some behavior interactive bug fest, but Blasphemous is definitely not free from the occasional hitbox jank. These moments are pretty few and far between, but never impossible. The core experience is solid despite the jank. I can count on one hand the moments that genuinely frustrated me since you end up pretty overpowered with the game's many upgrade systems regardless. To once again make a Doom comparison, this game is a bit bloated with upgrades. With a few different categories and almost all of them to do with combat, the game sets you up to scale from being a doofus to a demigod in whatever way is most comfortable. The upside to this is it allows for really great playstyle variety between between playthroughs. Do you want to get in your enemy's face and grind them into the stonework, or do you prefer using your sword to replenish your Gatorade meter in between Dragon Ball Z attacks? The downside to this is that there's a bit of a reverse difficulty curve. Here's an example. Early on, the game throws these humble whip enemies at you. They run at you and can slap you with a couple variations of attacks to keep you on your toes. They're pretty tanky boys early on, but still easily dispatched with patience and attentiveness. Very good tool to help the player learn the melee combat, or how to circumvent it if they don't like it. But later on in the game, when you can throw exploding Beyblades, have actual Devil May Cry attacks, can summon fucking lightning storms, and have a health bar roughly half the size of my massive Kostolfo pillow. Seriously, this thing is like 20 by 60, I didn't even know they made pillows that big. What the fuck was I talking about? Even at the point in the game where you can vaporize whatever's on screen in 10 different ways, they're still throwing the whip enemies at you except, get this, they're blue now. They don't stand a chance. Most things like game don't stand a chance, but the combat is so visceral and satisfying that it's not a problem for me. There's also a bit of a power discrepancy between certain upgrades. You have a rosary that you can slot one of many different beads into for some passive stat buffs. They don't tell you exact amounts though. If they were more balanced that would be fine, but they're not, so here's why it's a problem. One of these beads is the Knot of Hair. It increases all melee damage you do by 5% according to the wiki. I mean, that's not awful for something you can slot in and out with no commitment whenever you want and are going to be using alongside multiple other rosary beads. This is fine. Well, here's the drop of coagulated ink, which increases prayer damage. Not that they particularly need it, prayers typically hit harder than any of your other offensive moves already, but I'm glad that it's here regardless. So how much does it increase the damage by? Oh dear. My first playthrough was a character that was focused on sword moves and mobility in combat. Here's this boss fight, Despacito or however you say that. On this character, I beat the fight first try and it took a couple minutes. It wasn't a pushover, I was still thinking on my feet and dodging moves, very much engaging with the game. Well, my second playthrough was a character focused on prayer usage. Here is that fight against Exposito in its entirety.
so the balance is more than a little shagged, but it's always in favor of the player rather than against them. You never feel blatantly underpowered, or at least I didn't. Besides, most of the stuff needs to be found, whether it's hidden behind a fake wall, an obtuse puzzle, an elaborate NPC questline, or a combination of the three to get some of the really overpowered shit you'll need to go off the beaten path. You can still complete the game just fine without doing all that oofy, ouchy, brain hurdy type stuff. I don't know why you would, though. Do you really want to miss out on the blasphemous arcade cabinet? Man. They just don't make them like they used to. Which transitions me into talking about the world design as a whole. It's amazing. Definitely the strongest aspect of the game next to the presentation, mostly due to how well the game mixes style and substance. I have a deep respect for an open-ended game like this that foregoes a traditional checkpoint fast travel system in favor of more immersive solutions. Tons of routes from current areas to previous ones, elevators that connect areas together, fast travel portals that are convenient but you still need to go a bit out of your way for them. Think Hollow Knight Stagways. I could elaborate on this more, but all you really need to know is that I was progressing through areas 8 hours into the game, finding shortcuts back to areas 30 minutes into the game. Combine this with how stylish and striking every everything feels, and exploring is easily the most fun and memorable part of the game, at least for me. I don't want to go in detail at all because it would be against the spirit of the game, so let's just move on to the story instead. How the fuck am I gonna- If you're a lore whore, someone who likes reading video game stories and item descriptions or obscure NPC dialogue, you'll probably like Blasphemous for its story. If you're not that type of person, well... I think it's still enjoyable. Beyond the flowery, hard-to-understand dialogue, insane imagery, and funny cone helmets, Blasphemous is, at its core, a story about people trying to survive against something that they don't understand. It's ambiguous and subversive to the very end, to the point where I don't really see any reason to do a spoiler section, or talk much about the story at all. There isn't just one plot thread to follow, there's an entire spider web. Trying to explain any of it would take way too much time out of this video, and besides, you really don't need to understand everything. The world of Blasphemous lives and dies on feeling alien, but not totally impenetrable. Caveman brain know that miracle bad, cone helmet good. But just because I don't have a lot to say on the story doesn't mean I'm done quite yet. See, Blasphemous has two free DLC packs, with a third one set to release in December. What we can play right now is Strife and Ruin and The Stir of Dawn. I'm gonna talk about Strife first, since that one's shorter. This is a crossover DLC where you do a short questline for Miriam, the main character of Blood. Stained. The setup is this, she's trapped in your world somehow and needs to get back to hers and you're the only one who can help her escape. She tasks you with entering a series of portals that lead to some timed platforming challenges. There's five in total, and each one is harder than the last. Complete them all, she gives you something cool, and goes home. A simple premise, but the execution kinda made me want to drink. First of all, these portals are hidden in some pretty obnoxious spots. All of them are behind fake walls haphazardly placed throughout the entire game. 99% of people are only going to find like two or three before needing to look the rest up. That's kinda whack, but it gets worse. The main the problem is plain as day, honestly. Strife and Ruin is focused on movement and platforming when the game has bare-bones mechanics to support it. It's little more than an exercise in frustration. Not a fan. I'm pretty sure I died more in this one room than everywhere else in the game put together. Oh well, at least the music is nice. Thankfully, Stir of Dawn is much better. The first half of the DLC is focused on overhauling the main game, so if you didn't play it on release, you probably won't notice most of these changes. New NPCs, new areas, and a ton of new executions, and that's just what the base game got. Seriously, playing this game on release without Nascimento was pain. The second half of this DLC is the main event, implementing a surprisingly elaborate New Game Plus mode. You keep all of your prayers, rosary beads, sword hearts, relics, and sword shrines, but everything else is reset. Don't be discouraged from exploring, you definitely missed stuff the first time around. Also exclusive to New Game Plus is the Penance System, three different difficulty modifiers that change the feel of the game. In order of least to most painful, they are Penance of the Unwavering Faith, all of your sword attacks only do half damage, you lose fervor when getting 
hit, but you now regenerate fervor passively without needing to do anything. Penance of the Bleeding Heart, intended more as a nod to classic Metroidvania, instead of having a health bar, you have health orbs, and getting hit makes you lose one, your healing now regenerates one orb immediately and the rest over time, and enemies now respawn instantly upon leaving whatever area you're in. Finally, we got Penance of the True Guilt. You lose all tiers of atonement when you die, get max guilt instantly when you die, and the bile flasks no longer heal you, instead giving you fervor. I don't have any footage of this one because I don't hate myself that much. This system is completely optional, by the way. You can play through New Game Plus without choosing a penance. It's not forced on you. However, beating the game with each penance rewards you with a unique rosary bead. You want that 100% completion, don't you? The second major addition is an entire quest line focused on defeating a number of new boss fights sprinkled throughout the game. Hope you're ready, too, because these golden girls are way harder than any of the other bosses. The story is, without spoiling, more of the same but presented as a side event, yet another standalone plot thread to add onto the pile. It's still enjoyable, of course, the bosses and areas are some of the prettiest the game has to offer, and the boss music lives rent-free in my head. Okay, I think I'm done here. Kept you waiting, huh? I don't really have an excuse for how long this video took. Sorry. Obviously, Blasphemous gets a massive recommend from me. Its combination of confident style and chunky, satisfying combat make it fun in the moment and fun to think about afterwards as well. It's cheap and has a lot of content, and even if you're indecisive, there's a demo. Before I wrap this video up, I need to address a couple things. Yes, I know about Blasphemous 2, and yes, I'll do a video about it when the time comes. Now, will I do a video on Wounds of Eventide? That depends. Depends. If it's basically a series of inconsequential mini-games like Strife and Ruin, probably not. If it's much more elaborate like Stir of Dawn, then yeah, sure. That's all for now. Next video will be, uh, fucking something. I don't know. We'll see how I feel. Till then.